Well, good morning, everyone. Blessed Sabbath. I see some old friends here today. My brother right there from Walla Walla. Good to see you, man. And Michael and Deborah are here. Where are they? There's Michael. Deborah. There she is. All right. These are original, original members who, who went to Loma Linda to bring the gospel. Uh, Michael's a professor there in Loma Linda School of Health. Yes, and uh, we had wonderful years together. And, you know, Michael and Deborah helped shape this whole idea of um, personal ministry, a personal mission to reach individual people for Jesus. And uh, we all went through the trying to learn how to, and they were terrific role models. I kind of viewed them as a little bit more advanced than the rest of us. They seemed to really naturally connect with people. And you got to understand, when you're... When you're a part of an organization like Adventism, you're connecting with people typically who are other Adventists. And uh, Michael and Deborah had their own business, and they had they seemed to be much more comfortable in doing that. And uh, and then Michael brought in his drumming and his clarinet and his bass singing, and then Deborah would be at the door just hugging everybody. You guys remember? Yeah, we don't forget. We don't forget here. Anyway, welcome. Glad you're here. Is come up to see Johnny a little bit, Pastor Johnny. Yeah, good memories, good memories. Oh, Christmas is over. Is that all right? It's all right. Okay. We have a new year ahead of us, and um, I wanted to just, even though it's not the Christmas season, get my chance to talk about this CD. Uh, I don't know how you feel about Christmas music after Christmas, but this is a debut album that was debuted last Sabbath. And I had the pleasure of watching this on a 75-inch screen TV, my daughter and son-in-law's house. And um, it covered the whole wall, and they looked great. How many of you are here for that performance? All right, we have some of you here. You might want to go back. Chris, we have it on archive. Just go to City Sanctuary. We have a subscription uh, that you can join and be a part of our channel, as it were. And listen to that concert. It actually was a pretty good mix online, and we've been working at that. This is a, a very important thing because this is a new concept for us. Uh, really, our first major CD debut uh, in a way that we can begin to reach our community, which really values, really values music, food, arts. And uh, this is an original concept, and it's an original uh, debut. And so these are available, Aaron, where? Come talk to Aaron. We have them available, and uh, I'm sure they're very reasonable. And, of course, we don't take money on Sabbath, but we could work something out later. Okay. Very good. Anyway, I didn't want to let that moment pass, even though Christmas is a long ways from here now. Okay. So, um, most of the time I'm up here, I'm with other people, and... uh, but I wanted to tell you just a little bit about my own journey with, with music. So uh, by the time I went to college, um, guitar players uh, were just starting to be able to get on stage. You know, Terry Boyd's generation uh, was kind of like with that whole Wedgwood Trio controversy and the scandal of having guitars. It, in that era, if you were actually a guitar player and got to get on the rostrum, you were probably stuck behind someone standing. But if you got on the rostrum, Everybody, all the kids knew that guy got on there with his guitar. That's, that's the Adventism that we had in those days. Uh, the world looked at the Wedgwood Trio as, well, they're just another folk group. But it was big for us because they were professional and they had an attitude. And it's a reflection attitude of the 60s. And so it, they kind of spawned a whole generation of banjo players, bass players, and guitar players, and Terry was a part of that. By the time I got there, we were being allowed on the stage, but never with drums. And so uh, I had learned to teach myself to play the guitar with kind of a drum percussion beat, because I was just, you know, by myself. And so I said, well, they don't allow drums, but I can take my style up there. And by that time, I'd kind of developed a jazzy rock, R&B, kind of a funky style of rhythm. And uh, I was the first uh, guy, I can happily say, that played real jazz uh, at the PUC College Church on the main rostrum where Maury Venden preached. 
uh, stand-up bass player and I, and we did, jazz, we did jazz variations on hymns because hymns were, were the common ground, right? The common ground, if you're doing something that's new, find the hymn uh, that everybody loves and, and then try not to screw it up too much and, and push it forward. And so the guitar being on the rostrum is, is, is uh, kind of a piece of, uh, of a story that I'm a part of. And, uh, and I'm happy to. My style is very different than the bands I play in. So let's, let's see. Uh, it's not really singable. I've been told uh, people can't sing with you with this. But let's see. Let's see. Maybe they're wrong. Okay. Um, how about this, this little light of mine? Can we do that? All right. So typically we'll do this little light of mine. That's, what's that beat? One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Pretty standard. Okay. Why don't we amp this up, go fast, kind of a swing jazz, see if we can get through it. Try and keep up with me. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. What do you think? Hmm? So the focus is not so much lyrical, but what? Movement. Movement. All right. Can you, can you move? Yeah. By the way, I don't know how to dance, but I seem to be able to dance with my hands rhythmically. All right. All right. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Don't hold your notes, okay? Don't hold on to your notes. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. All around. All around the neighborhood, I'm gonna let it shine. All around the neighborhood, I'm gonna let it shine. All around the neighborhood, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Get it? This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Vibrato, that's the vibrato note. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine. Bring it in, bring it in. All right. And what I did, because I wanted to have the guitar up front, is I would find all the safe children's songs and, and, and do that. So often I would, you know, be allowed to play up front and... And we would do just like that. So this is kind of a retro thing. Okay, let's do something a little bit more basic. This is the day. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has made. I will rejoice. Bounce. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. One more time. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. That the Lord I will rejoice and be glad in it, be so glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Isn't that fun? Okay. Oh. I'll tell you what. Okay. Well, let me see if we can do this. I've been redeemed. You've been redeemed? Do you remember that song? That was really a staple in my teen years. And uh, so there's all kinds of different ways you can mess up a song. And uh, so kind of what I decided to do is uh, take some block chords and then add a little ZZ top.
kind of thing? All right. I've been redeemed. Come on. Where's the echo? Where's the echo? I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Filled with the Holy Ghost, I am. All my sins are washed away. I've been redeemed. Now, this is when you let the Elvis part out. Uh, you wobble your voice. Because that's when you start to show emotion. Okay? And that's... Not all. Oh, man. Maybe this, is this ahead of its time? I mean, this is really old, Donald, for me. Huh? Aaron, should I keep going? You mean you're the, you're the worship leader here? All right. <laughs> and that's not all. There's more beside. And that's not all. There's more beside, and that's not all, there's more beside. I've been to the river and I've been baptized. All my sins are washed away, I've been redeemed. You can talk about me, just as much as you please. Well, you can talk about me. You can talk about me just as much as you please But I'll talk about you when I'm on my knees All my sins are washed away I've been redeemed Let's go, baby. He's coming back Attitude to take us home Have you guys forgot how to be angry? Have you gotten too old? Come on, this is from the 60s uh, This is the 70s beat, actually And he's coming back Take us home. He's coming back to take us home. He's coming back to take us home where we will reap what we have sown. All my sins are washed away. I've been redeemed. That's a little Richard note. All right. Are you happy today? Uh, this kind of music, you should be happier than you were 10 minutes ago. Yeah. Are we? Yeah. Mm, it's endorphins, dopamine, and serotonin coming to life in your brain. <laughs> I'm happy. Um, let me see. I'm happy today. I'm happy today. Jesus, my Lord. Day because he's taken all my sins away, and that's why I'm happy today. Well, I'm smiling today. You know, how, have you ever watched these people on TV and they smile while they're singing? How do they do that? Practice. Let's try it. <laughs> I'm smiling today. I'm smiling. With Jesus, my Lord, I'm smiling today because He's taken all my sins away, and that's why I'm smiling today. Uh, all right, let's go back here. I'm praying today, I'm praying today with Jesus, my Lord, I'm praying today because He's taken all my sins away, and that's why I'm praying today. I'm sharing my faith, I'm sharing my faith with Jesus my Lord, I'm sharing my faith, he's taken all my sins away, and that's why I'm sharing, that's why I'm sharing, that's why I'm sharing my faith. Oh, happy, happy. Mm. Okay, I know what we can do. So, on a serious note, okay, so um, there's usually two songs that I will sing at a graveside over the years. 
And one of them is, um, I'll be seeing you in all the old familiar places. You remember, you know, you know that one? Yeah, it's a Sammy Kahn song. And the other one we do is this one. There's a land that is fairer than day. It's happy. And by faith, we can see it afar. For our Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore we will sing on that beautiful shore the melodious songs of the Will sorrow no more, not a sigh for the breaking of bread. Now in the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything. There's so much joy in music, and I'm just so happy to be a part of a church that loves music, all kinds of music, great music, good music, and we thank you for these songs today and how it's uplifted our spirits. Lord, we pray for Bert as he preaches today. The devil tried to keep him down last night and keep him in bed this morning, and we pray for his voice to keep him strong. He has an important message uh, for all of us to hear about life and the many things that he's come to understand in his journey of faith with you. We lift up, Lord, Tom's uh, precious mom who passed away, and bless, we pray for Tom and his father and the entire family, Grandma, that you will bring them comfort at this time. And She lived 99 years, and they were married 75 years, so the loss is enormous. So we lift up that family, Lord. Uh, we pray for Linda, Linda Ivy, with the flu. Please draw near to her, and at this moment, Lord, begin to raise her up, uh, is our prayer today. For all of our blessings, Lord, I also would like uh, a request for my wife, Lisa, who's having surgery Monday morning on her left arm. So we get that right arm done, it's already done, the left arm. Uh, it's amazing what, what could happen after that, so please just guide the surgeons. Now, Lord, we give our life into your hand, and we thank you for all of our blessings here at City Sanctuary. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite Tom White up and Patty to come up. We talk about finances here in this church, but we only do it once a year. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. 
as as Pastor Dan indicated, we we really try to keep the uh, finances to a minimum uh, here at City Sanctuary. And for those who are visiting, uh, we have birdhouses in the other room. Uh, the birdhouses started out as a tradition many, many years ago. Uh, actually, our first Sabbath at City Sanctuary, um, somebody asked, where do we put the offering? And we didn't have collection plates. And Pastor Dan happened to have a birdhouse in, his, in the back of his car. And uh, so he brought the birdhouse in, and that was the beginning of uh, where we collected our offerings. Uh, so from that time, that was a very small birdhouse, so we did create a little larger birdhouse uh, as, as we grew, and uh, our collections were a little larger. So... At, at this point, if anybody needs to make any year-end givings, um, the birdhouse is available. We can also give online, or you can talk to Patty. Um, and that's basically our three ways of, of giving. That's it. When Pastor Dan asked me to start working as the church treasurer, uh, going in, it just ended two years now, I said, I'll, I'll keep books for you, I'll pay the bills for you, make sure the light's on electricity is on, I will not get up front and beg for money. I will not do that. And he said, okay, you don't have to, except for once a year you need to say something. So check box for this year's uh, done that list. Um, and, you know, thanks, Don. The really good thing is we have not had to beg for money. God has blessed us. And I don't know how it comes. That birdhouse is amazing. People give online. Gifts come in. And it, it just happens. And everything that happens in this church, the lights on, the doors open, the rent is paid, everything you eat for breakfast, every cup of drink you have, children's programs, crafts, our parties, with the refreshments and the games and the, the, the activities that happen, all of that is funded by donation. Every penny of it comes as a gift from somebody in this group, this church family. It's all a gift. And I just want to say thank you. I, I don't always know where the gifts come from. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. It, it doesn't matter. It all works together, and it's beautiful, and you all are great. Thank you for not making me beg for money. I appreciate you. Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath to you. Thank you, Brother Don. Can you hear me? Am I on? Yep. All right. <clears throat> yes, I know you'd like to, Don. <laughs> well, happy Sabbath. It's really good to be here today. And uh, Pastor Dan, thank you so much for the music. Wasn't that amazing today? Um, love Pastor Dan's music. It's always unique, original. So thank you so much for putting us in the spirit. And uh, I just want to... Welcome, everybody here today, uh, especially a welcome to our visitors, um, if you're new here to C City Sanctuary, and uh, so great to see uh, friends that I haven't seen in many years uh, sitting in the back there, and um, it's just great, great to be here today. Um, and I also want to welcome everybody uh, online that, that's watching as well out in internet land, and, and we're blessed that we have the internet, right, to be able to stream our services so I just asked for a quick prayer for me, uh, as Pastor Dan mentioned, I uh, hadn't planned on getting sick this year, but as you can hear, I'm a little bit lower. T normally I'm a second tenor, but today I'm a baritone, um, and uh, came on, on Thursday, and I was like, oh, this is really good timing, right? <laughs> I'm supposed to speak on Sabbath, and uh, so I've been praying to the Lord, and, and He has sustained, and I know He will today um, also. So here we find ourselves um, at the end of 2019. Can you believe it? This is the final Sabbath of the year. Next week will be 2020, um, which is pretty amazing. I remember 20 years ago. How is that possible, right? Anybody remember Y2K? <laughs> yeah, there's a few out there that, that, that do remember that and all the, the hoopla about that. And here we are 20 years later. It's, it just is amazing how, how quickly it goes. 
So I don't know about you, um, but I love Christmas, Aaron. I love Christmas like you. <laughs> and uh, uh, the other thing that I like to do at this time of year is, especially towards the end of December and, and heading into the new year, is to contemplate uh, the, the previous year, what has happened in, in my life. Um, all the good things, the bad things, the travels. Many of you know I love to travel, uh, the places I've been to, things I've accomplished uh, and whatnot, looking at my, my work life, um, all that good stuff. But probably even more importantly is uh, I also like to take a, a, a spiritual exam- examination, if you will, of my, my life, my, my walk with the Lord, uh, my journey with God, and exploring all of that too. And actually, uh, the Apostle Paul Uh, he uh, admonishes, he implores us to um, examine our life, to examine our faith, right? That's actually in 2 Corinthians somewhere. We're not going to look that up. Um, So it is a biblical uh, idea to examine one's faith, one's life, journey with the Lord. Um, And I don't know about you, but sometimes I can get really discouraged when I look at my my spiritual journey with uh, with God. Um, You know, we live in a, a world where we have an enemy, right? Uh, his name is Satan, and he comes along frequently, it seems like in my life, uh, to remind me uh, of my, my, uh, my sins, my discretions, my, uh, my failures, and uh, it can be um, discouraging, right, um, to, to think about those things. Um, and so kind of what I want to talk about and explore today is this idea of forgetting our past, Okay. Forgetting uh, our, our failures, um, and they, they are many, are they not? <laughs> um, just raising my hand to that one. And so I just want to kind of explore what the Bible has to say about forgetting our past and how God actually um, uh, asks us all to, to forget our past. Um, and so that's what we're going to be kind of looking at, looking at today. Uh, but before we do that, I, I do want to um, just pray, so if you could uh, join me in prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this um, Sabbath day. It's so beautiful outside. It's so nice to see the sunshine. And Lord, I'm a sinner, and I don't know why I'm up here today other than that um, you've asked me to be here. Uh, I ask that you would um, uh, speak through me, Father, and that the Holy Spirit would prick my heart and prick uh, the hearts of everyone that's listening today. I ask that you would... Uh, Give us a word of encouragement and um, show us the way that you would have us go, Father. In your precious name, I pray, amen. So I want to look at um, the the lives or the stories of of three different uh, men in the Bible as we kind of explore this theme, this idea of forgetting our past. And the first is uh, the Apostle Paul. And uh, I don't know about you, but um, whenever I think of the Apostle Paul, I I think of a very uh, godly man, a very righteous man um, who did amazing things for God. And uh, I kind of tend to put him up on a pedestal, right? A little notch above, although I shouldn't because he was a human being like myself and the rest of us here today. Um, But he, as we know, wrote much of the New Testament, about, I think, a third of the New Testament. And... um, um, Interestingly enough, um, Paul's life uh, did not really start out um, as godly as, as, as we may think. You know, he was, he was born into a Jewish family and um, was very zealous for the Lord um, in his early life. And he thought that he was doing the right thing for God, right? And one of those things that he, he did uh, early on was to persecute the early Christians, right? And... Um, I think that's kind of an interesting lesson for all of us is that maybe sometimes when we think we're doing the right thing for the Lord, we need to kind of examine that, maybe relook at that, right? Because Paul, or he was Saul at the time, right? He thought, he thought he was doing all these great things for God, um, and yet look what he did um, by persecuting, you know, the early Christians. Um, one of those people that he persecuted and, and had uh, murdered, um, we learn about in the book of Acts, and that's... Um, the life of Stephen, right? Um, the Bible tells us that Saul uh, laid his coat down while Stephen was being stoned. And Stephen is, liter- you know, is praying to God. He looks up into heaven. He sees Jesus there. 
and um, is, is praying, and um, Saul is standing there, and he's giving his blessing while this is happening. Um, he did not oppose this, the stoning of, of Stephen. And I think it's going to be interesting uh, in heaven, right, when, when we get there, um, that there will be this reunion between these two men, uh, uh, Paul now and um, Stephen. And I can imagine that Paul's, I could be wrong, but is going to go up to Stephen and, and say, would you forgive me for um, having you murdered, you know, having you killed? Um, so that'll be an interesting interaction to watch. Um, so the story goes on in the book of Acts. Uh, we, we know that and we learn that um, Saul has a conversion experience and he, he becomes converted uh, uh, with, to Christ. And um, I can um, only imagine that Paul, as he became known, um, had a lot of regret for the stoning of Stephen. Um, and uh, not only regret for that, but regret for a lot of other things in his life that you and I don't know about right now, right? Um, and I actually believe that Paul um, talks about uh, regret in his books. Um, he doesn't actually specifically use that word regret um, but um, I think the idea is there. And so if you have a, your Bible, um, I'd like to invite you to um, turn with me to um, his book, Philippians, chapter 3. And um, I just want to read a, a passage of, of his writing that kind of um, is my thesis today for, for what we're talking about. And so it's starting in verse 12. Philippians, chapter 3, verse uh, 12. So, and I'm reading from the um, uh, New Living Translation. It says, Paul writes, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. And this is Paul writing, right? So, <laughs> again, I put him up on a pedestal and it's like, what? This guy hasn't reached perfection yet? I, I think he has, but he's like, no, I haven't reached perfection. Uh, he goes on to say, but I press on to possess that perfection for which... Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, and here's the punchline about what I want to share today. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. And then jumping down to verse 16, he concludes here by saying, but we must hold on to the progress we have already made. Isn't that awesome? This idea of um, holding on to the progress we've already made. I really like that thought. You know, um, I, don't, I know a lot of you here in this room, and I think the majority of us um, probably claim to be Christians, and there's some folks that I don't know in here and, and online, I don't know who's watching, and maybe there's somebody in here who um, hasn't professed to be a Christian. Uh, maybe, maybe you're not a believer in, in God, but um, I do believe that all of us are on a journey, a spiritual journey, even if you're not a Christian. And I do believe that um, the Holy Spirit is working on on each person. And so I think what Paul is saying here is, you know, no matter where you're at in your journey, whether you're a babe in Christ or um, you have, again, even haven't professed um, Christ's name or maybe you're someone like Pastor Dan, right, who's um, in his late 50s, if I can say that. Sorry, Pastor Dan. <laughs> um, I'm 51, so I've lived a few years, Shane. <laughs> Same thing. Um, some of us have been Christians longer. But my point is, is that um, Paul's saying to hold on, right? Hold on to that journey. Hold on to your experience with Christ and don't, don't let go of that. Uh, the other um, two phrases in this passage that really jumped out at me when I was um, reading, reading and studying this is uh, the phrase to press on and to hold on. And actually, Paul uses that, um, that press on uh, phrase twice. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. And then in verse 14, I press on to reach the end of the race and, and then hold on. So uh, if you don't remember anything else today that I say, 
and you, you walk out those doors, um, just remember, you guys, to press on and to hold on. Press on and hold on, right? So a lot of you know um, that I uh, correspond with a, a gentleman who's been incarcerated in a prison in Wisconsin for many years, much of his adult life. And his name is Kenneth. And so we've been writing to one another, and, and, and we encourage each other. Um, and it's amazing, this guy, he's such an encouragement to me from prison, um, and that's a whole other story right there, but um, frequently he ends his letters by saying, or he uses this phrase, he says, Bert, keep on keeping on with Jesus. Isn't that cool? Keep on keeping on with Jesus. I'd never heard that before. And um, as I was studying this week, um, that phrase uh, reminded me of what Paul is saying here by pressing on and, and holding on, right? So all of those words together mean keep going, don't give up, don't quit, right? Um, so, you know, this idea of, um, that Paul um, talks about of forgetting our past and uh, moving forward is also echoed um, throughout the Bible, and I want to share another uh, text that comes from the book of Isaiah. So if you want to go there, it's Isaiah um, chapter 43, verse 18. And I'm actually going to read it from the NIV because I like, I like how it says it here. And this is actually God talking um, to us. And God says to forget the former things and do not dwell on the past. Forget the former things and do not dwell on the past. So I love that because, number one, God said it, right? So if God says it, we should, we should listen. And, um, boy, I don't know about you, but, man, it can be so hard <laughs> to forget the past. Um, I really struggle. I'll just be honest, you guys. I really struggle with that, struggle with forgetting my past. Um, and so... I have to really cling to verses like this um, and um, by faith um, say, God, I can't, I can't you know, forget my past, but you're asking me to, so you've got to give me that ability to forget my past. Um, and so um, with Paul, you know, how, you know, he's giving us the this, this same advice, um, to forget the former things, to forget the past, to look, to look forward. So how... How was Paul then, you guys, able, able to do this, is my question. Um, well, I have um, maybe a little bit of information that we can um, uh, learn from. And um, there's a book that some of you have heard of. It's called um, The Acts of the Apostles. And um, there's some really interesting information in there about Paul's life. And I, I really like this um, I wanted to just share a couple of um, sentences from this chapter um, about Saul that I think give us some insight into how he was able to forget his past. So it says, As Saul yielded himself fully to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, he saw the mistakes of his life and recognized the far-reaching claims of the law of God. So I think just right there, the, the, the word that jumps out to me is that uh, Saul, before he become, became Paul, he yielded to the Holy Spirit. He was being convicted by the Holy Spirit, right? And um, I think that there's a lesson there for, for me and, and all of us, right? That, um, and I believe that the Holy Spirit is working on every person in this room, every person on this planet. And I guess I would throw the question out to you, and you don't have to answer, but what's the Holy Spirit convicting you of today in your heart? I know what he's convicted me of, um, and, but I can't answer that question for you. Um, but Saul knew what, was, what he was being, being convicted of. Um, and then it goes on to say, um, Paul had been a proud Pharisee, confident that he was justified by his good works. But he now bowed before God with the humility and simplicity of a little child, confessing his own unworthiness and pleading the merits of of a crucified and risen Savior. So as he's facing conviction by the Holy Spirit, um, 
he turns to God, he bows down, and he turns to Christ asking for forgiveness, right, of his sins. And he, and he realizes that he'd been raised this, this zealous Pharisee, and he'd been counting on his own works, right? But when he really saw who, who he was, he's like, wow, I am nothing, right? And only Jesus um, can save me. Um, goes on to say here that um, his prayers were not in vain. The inmost thoughts and emotions of his heart were transformed by divine grace. And his nobler fac- faculties were brought into harmony with the eternal purposes of God. His inmost thoughts and emotions of his heart were transformed by divine grace. That's what happens, you guys, when the Holy Spirit comes along, knocks at our heart's door, and we, um, we submit to him, we allow him to come in. He will change our heart. He will change our minds, right? And then finally, it just says that Christ and his righteousness became to Saul more than the whole world. Wow. Isn't that amazing? I don't know if I can say that about my life, if I'm being honest. Christ and his righteousness became to Saul more than the whole world. And, you know, I mean, we see, we see what happened, you know, all in much of the New Testament, right? He went to all of the known world at that time and proclaimed the gospel. He was in prison for Christ. He was shipwrecked for Jesus. Um, he proclaimed the gospel, and then ultimately he became a martyr for Christ, right? So that sets the bar pretty high uh, for, for me, certainly. And so I think that um, uh, this is how Paul was able to forget his past, how he was able to maybe forgive himself for um, the stoning of Stephen and all the other discretions that he had, he had because before, you guys, he... Uh, Saul, if you think about it, he was a very proud man. And I think um, one of the characteristics that goes along with being prideful is selfishness, right? And looking at, um, looking at yourself and not caring for other people. And that's, that's who Saul was before he met Jesus. But after he met Jesus, his heart was melted. He had a, uh, an outward focus, Right? So he was, he was concerned about his neighbor, his brother, his sister. And um, he was no lo- longer looking inside. He was looking up to Jesus. And um, I think that that's one of the keys of forgetting our past um, is by serving one another and encouraging one another. Um, so uh, this idea of, of forgetting our past I think that there's two, uh, two sides of the coin of, of forgetfulness, if you will. Uh, we've kind of talked a little bit about, um, you know, forgetting our past and moving forward. But I do think there's another side of that coin, which is that a lot of times, and, and I'll raise my hand on this one, we tend to um, forget God's goodness and forget his grace in our life uh, when we have gone astray when we have um, fallen um, repeatedly. And, you know, we can blame a lot of that on our enemy, the devil, uh, because, um, and again, I'm just raising my hand on this one, when, when that happens, the devil's right there, isn't he? He's like, oh man, look at you. You screwed up again for the gazillionth time doing the same thing, right? Who are you? God is never going to accept you. You're never going to get into heaven. And Satan... Um, he, he paints this horrible picture we talked about in Sabbath school this morning. He, he paints this awful picture of who God is, you know, that he's sitting on the throne and he's, he's looking down his long nose at you and pointing his finger at you. And, and that's a lie, you guys. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Um, and um, so anyway, I guess my point is, is that um, we can get stuck, we can get mired in um, and forgetting that, yeah, we've fallen, but God still loves us. And if anything, he's, he's, he is there even more with us, you guys, in our sin um, than maybe when we're, when we're riding, riding high. Uh, and there's, a, there's another person in the Bible that I think illustrates um, this um, idea or thought of um, forgetting God, and, and, and that's in the life um, of Elijah. 
who was another great man of God, right? Um, and uh, so I want to explore a little bit about Elijah's life. Um, I think most people are familiar with um, the story of uh, Mount Carmel, right? And this is the, the story where um, there's a spiritual battle um, between um, Elijah and the pagan prophets. And, um, uh, you know, the pagan, they have this altar there, and the pagan prophets are crying out to their God. They're cutting themselves, uh, you know, asking their gods to rain down fire from heaven to consume this altar, and, and nothing happens, except they get bloodied, right? And, and they're a mess. Um, well, then Elijah, he kind of ups the ante, so to speak, right? And he douses this altar in water, tons and tons of water, and then he prays to God, the God of heaven, the only true God, right? And what does God do? Brings fire down from heaven, right? <laughs> and, uh, and the altar is consumed. And so that's a huge victory for God and for Elijah. And God then asks um, Elijah to have these pagan prophets destroyed, killed. And I think there was, I don't know, 200, 300 of them. There was a lot of these guys, right? And so Elijah has these prophets destroyed. Well, who does that get the attention of but none other than Queen Jezebel? And um, according to the Bible, she was pretty much the most wicked queen that ever existed, and she was not happy with Elijah. And so she um, puts a call out on, on Elijah's life. And when Elijah gets wind of this, um, you know, he, you'd think that <laughs> he just had this huge mountaintop experience, right? And you'd think that he would not cower and that he'd be like, oh, I'm not, I'm not worried about this. But, you know, far from it, he was depressed and he actually ran away from this, this woman. And um, I want to share some commentary on, on this story that I think is really amazing. Um, this is from uh, a magazine called The Review and Herald, which some of you have heard of. Um, and this is what it says. Uh, the reaction which frequently follows high faith and glorious success was pressing upon Elijah. He feared the, the reformation begun on Carmel might not be lasting. Depression seized him. You don't have to raise your hand, but has anyone dealt with depression in this room? And I know there's a few that have. <laughs> yes. You guys, Elijah was depressed. Elijah! <laughs> wow. He had been exalted to Pisgah's top. Now he was in the valley. While under the inspiration of the Almighty, he had stood the severest trial of faith. But in this time of discouragement, with Jezebel's threatening message sounding in his ears, and Satan still apparently prevailing through the plotting of this wicked woman... Elijah lost his hold on God. What? Elijah lost his hold on God? How is that possible? This great man of the Bible, this man who had a school of the prophets and did all of these amazing miracles. I don't know about you, but that's encouraging to little Bert Logan, <laughs> who has none of those credentials, right? Um, that, and I'm sad that Elijah lost his hold on God, but it gives me hope, Right? Um, he had been exalted above measure, and the reaction was tremendous. Forgetting God, he fled, going on and on until he found himself in a dreary waste and alone. Utterly wearied, he sat down to rest under a juniper tree. And sitting there, he, it gets worse, you guys. He's, he's depressed, so it's going to get worse here. He requested for himself that he might die. It is enough. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And then, at last, utterly exhausted, he falls asleep. So I know a lot of, I know depression is a serious thing, and, um, you know, it, it definitely can lead to those thoughts of, uh, you know, this is it. I want to give up. And it sounds like this is what Elijah was experiencing, you guys, which is pretty amazing to think about. Um, He'd given up on the Lord. And um, so here's that other side of the, the, the coin of forgetfulness. He, he forgot God. He forgot God's goodness and how God had helped him, you know, destroy these pagan prophets. He forgot that God had uh, um, 
consumed this altar, right? All the great things that he had done. Um, so here comes the encouraging part um, for you and for me. Into the experience of all, there come times of disappointment and discouragement, days when sorrow is the portion, and it is hard to believe that God is still the kind benefactor of his earthborn children, days when troubles harass the soul till death seems preferable to life. It is at such times that many lose their hold on God and are brought into the slavery of doubt, the bondage of unbelief. But could we at such times discern with spiritual insight the meaning of God's providences we could, where we should see angels of God seeking to save us from ourselves? So what that tells me is that in our darkest, darkest moment, when we're depressed, when we want to give up, we want to throw in the towel, who's there, you guys? God is right there with you. You might not feel it, and actually we're told we shouldn't rely on our feelings, right? Because feelings come and go. Um, we need to rely on this, right? Rely on the promises of God and take them to the bank, so to speak. Um, and then just kind of concluding with um, Elijah, and we'll move on here. Um, it says, uh, oh, I wanted to read this too. Um, in the darkest days when appearances seem, and this is uh, advice for you and me, um, in the darkest days when appearances seem most forbidding, fear not. Have faith in God. He knows your every need. Matthew. <laughs> he has all power. His infinite love and compassion never weary. Fear not that he will not fulfill his promises. Don't you love that phrase, fear not? I know there's a lot of Bible scholars in this room, and, and you've read that, right? Throughout the whole Bible, starting the Old Testament, all the way through the New Testament, God, has, God says, fear not, right, to the Israelites. He says, fear not to Daniel. Uh, fear not through Gabriel um, to uh, the Virgin Mary. Fear not to um, John the Revelator. And I love that. Fear not. He has, he has your back. Did God forsake Elijah? Oh, no. He loved him no less when he, for, when he felt forsaken of God. So, hallelujah. He didn't forget Elijah, you guys. And he has not and will not forget you or me. Amen? Thank you. <laughs> okay, so that's Elijah. Um, the last person that I wanted to um, kind of um, look at real quick is um, our supreme example, right? The best example in the Bible, and that would be Christ, our sweet, dear Jesus, right? And I want to just kind of talk quickly about uh, uh, an experience in Christ's life in the Garden of Gethsemane. And, you know, Christ um, obviously was uh, not a sinful man, but he was a man, um, and he did have our nature. We don't understand all of that. Uh, we will someday in heaven. But what I wanted to share about this is... Um, it's the story of the transfiguration of Christ in the, in the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. And, you know, he's approaching um, being crucified. He's approaching the cross. And, you know, all during his life on earth, who was right behind him but the devil, right? To tempt, to annoy, to ultimately destroy Christ was his, his goal. And the, the Garden of Gethsemane was no, no exception. And so I believe that when Jesus is facing this, um, that the devil is right there, and he's, he's tempting Christ at this point. He's putting doubt in his mind. He's tempting him to doubt his father. He's tempting him to, uh, to forget who he is, that he's the son of God, right? He's tempting him to forget um, where he's going, that he will, he will die, but he will be resurrected, and he will eventually uh, be with his father in heaven and have saved all of humanity. Um, and um, so during this, um, this experience, you know, we, we saw from Elijah that in his, um, in his trial that God sent an angel to um, encourage uh, Elijah. And God certainly could have sent an angel to encourage Christ, could he not? He could have sent a whole legion of angels to do that. Uh, but he didn't. Who did he send to Christ at the transfiguration? 
I heard it out there, Moses and Elijah. Wow, I just think that's amazing, you guys. So these are not heavenly beings. Well, they're heavenly beings at that point, but before they went to heaven, they weren't, right? They're men. They were sinful men um, who had trials, who had disappointments. Um, And God, in his wisdom, he knew um, their experience, and Jesus was a man who had um, emotions. The Bible tells us that Jesus wept. Um, And so I believe that God chose um, Elijah and Moses to go. And I I just can't wait to get to heaven and and to talk to those three and say, what was your conversation, right? I just can can only imagine that Moses and Elijah are coming alongside Christ saying, Jesus, hang in there. You know, this is really tough. This is tough, but you can do it, and here's why right? Um, You have all of humanity, and and God is for you. He loves you, and he, all of heaven is for you. We're all, we're all backing you, so don't give up, Jesus. Don't give up, and um, praise the Lord that um, they were there um, for Christ. Um, So, um, yeah, that's, I guess, my final example of, of, of the three men um, in the Bible, and, and praise the Lord that Jesus, um, he, did, he did cling to those promises, right? He clinged on, cling, clung to God, I should say. Um, so this Bible, right, has, uh, like I said, many, many promises, and um, they're for you and me, you guys. Um, and just kind of concluding here, we're, we are kind of wrapping things up. I wanted to share, again, in this theme of... Um, uh, forgetting our past. I want to share three other texts that um, are really encouraging. This is from the book of Micah. Um, and um, Micah says, Once again, you will have compassion on us. You will trample our sins under your feet and throw them into the depths of the ocean. Isn't that awesome? Amen is right. Um, I think it's a great visual. I mean, I can't imagine that God is literally up there stamping our sins, but it's kind of a a fun visual. And then, how deep is the ocean, you guys? Pretty deep, right? So it's just a nice metaphor that God, he basically puts our sins out out of mind, out of place. David has this idea also in the book of Psalms 103, where David says, he, God, has removed our sins as far from us as the east from the west. And then finally, um, um, Isaiah, oh, well, God says through Isaiah, um, I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Isn't that beautiful imagery? Yeah? I mean, we, you know, we've, we have these amazing, amazing clouds living here in Oregon and, and mist, and they're beautiful, but they're quite ethereal, right? And what happens to clouds and mist eventually? They're gone. They disappear. And this is what God is saying, is like the clouds, your sins are gone. And how is that possible, right? God is God, so he can do anything, but he's like this supercomputer too, I feel like. I don't mean disrespect, but that knows everything, right? He sees everything, and how can he forget? But he says, I have, forget, I have forgotten your sins, you guys, and I've redeemed you. And so I want you to also forget your past. Um, Two other quick quotes, and then we'll finish. Um, In the book, Steps to Christ, I love this quote. Uh, It says that we shall often have to bow down and weep at the feet of Jesus because of our shortcomings and mistakes. Wow. That is me, for sure. But we are not to be discouraged, you guys. Even if we are overcome by the enemy, we are not cast off, not forsaken, and rejected of God. No, Christ is at the right hand of God who makes intercession for us. And, that, and we saw that in the, the experience of Elijah, right? He was discouraged. He asked God to basically kill him, and God's like, no, I'm not going to do that. I love you, Elijah. Um, and then the, the last quote that kind of goes along with that is from a book called Heavenly Places. It says, um, Satan will come to you and to me saying, you are a sinner, Well, duh. (laughs) Um, You are a sinner. But do not let him fill your mind with the thought that because you are sinful, God has cast you off. 
Say to him, say to Satan, yes, I am a sinner. I'll raise my hand. And for that reason, I need a savior. I need forgiveness and pardon. And Christ says that if I come to him, I shall not perish. Hallelujah, right? In his letter to me, I read, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I believe the word he has left for me. Isn't that awesome that we can tell the enemy, leave, you know, Christ did that. He said, get behind me. And we can do the same thing, you guys, because we have a Savior who died for us. So um, as we, um, we finish and we leave 2019, um, I want you to be encouraged, you know, um, We've all had the ups and downs of this year, but um, the good news is um, what we just heard this morning, right? And that um, uh, please leave here knowing that God loves you, and Christ loves you, the angels love you, and that all of heaven, you guys, is on your side going into 2020. I believe that with all of my heart, and um, someone quoted this morning in Sabbath school, um, the verse, um, that he who began a good work in you will complete it, right? That's future. Hold on to that progress. So you guys, let's um, press on and let's hold on um, as we go into 2020. So let's bow our heads. Dear Jesus, thank you so much um, for being here. Thank you for um, encouraging us, Father, through the life of Paul and the life of Elijah and many, many others that are in the Bible, but ultimately, Jesus, um, your life and your example to us. And Father, we're just so grateful for you, Jesus, that you would come, you would leave heaven and make yourself nothing uh, to become one of us so that we could have your glory, we could, we could become an heir with you. It just boggles our minds, Father. And so help us to not forget that. Um, Jesus, as we head into the new year, help us to stay focused on you. Help us to get our eyes off of ourselves and onto our neighbors, our brothers, and our sisters uh, so that we can um, forget the past and move forward and look forward to a great future with you um, in eternity. I thank you, Jesus, and be with us the rest of this day. In your name I pray, amen. Well, you guys, happy Sabbath, and I wish you a happy new year. We will see you um, next Sabbath, hopefully, and if not, online. So God bless you.